Friedrich Nietzsche, the famous philosopher, philologist, and psychologist, famously said, The whole of the morality of Europe is based upon values which are useful to the herd. Today we're making a short video on herd morality or slave morality versus master morality and how I witnessed this recently in a graduation ceremony for my sister. So I attended this high school graduation and I heard four speeches in a row about kindness. Be more kind, the preachers of equality spoke from the podium. You know, bring more kindness into the workplace. Bring more kindness into life. Kindness makes everyone feel good and more happy around you. You never know if someone's having a bad day. So just be kind. That's all you need. I heard many of these very heartfelt, compassionate speeches that all centered around this core idea. And the whole time, I was getting more and more sick to my stomach. Anger was building in my core. Is kindness the highest value? Is that the highest virtue in life? Like, we're about, we're sending these kids off onto a grand adventure. Going to college, starting a career, starting a family. Like, going out, they're leaving the nest. They're leaving the shire. And, and we have Gandalf up there just being like, yo, all you need is kindness and Mount Doom will fall. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Is kindness the thing that's going to unleash your potential and lead you to the deepest experience of life? Is kindness the thing that's going to prepare you for the intense times of suffering, of challenge, of loss, of heartbreak? Is kindness the thing that's going to give you the courage to let go and become something new? Is kindness the thing that's going to make life great and free? Honestly, I'm not so sure. Now, kindness can be a good thing, especially, you know, if someone's having a hard time, like being a little more kind in the world, you know, might be, a, has a positive impact. But what's a bad thing is that most everyone I've ever met has been kind to my face, mostly because they haven't had the courage to be anything but kind. They don't have the courage to be real, to tell me the truth, to let me know how they're actually feeling. And I think the world's had enough false kindness. We are drowning in safety and superficiality and equality. So what do we actually need? And it got me thinking. You know, I just wrote a whole book, The Psychology of Slaying Dragons. And so much of it is about courage, excellence, truth, integrity, discipline, forbearance. These are the qualities that actually move life forward. You know, these are the things that liberate you from attachments, from addictions, from limitations, and lead to broader horizons. I never could have left a toxic relationship. I never could have defeated my insane, you know, cycles with addiction. I never could have battled the resistance to building the body I wanted, to building the community I wanted, the resistance to writing a book, the resistance to building a business, you know, facing the fear to leave home, to start over, to start a new life. I never could have done any of those things with just kindness. In fact, none of them would have happened. I would have just been one of the many in the herd following the, you know, going with all the other sheep towards their doom towards maybe a corporate job that's unfulfilling, towards all the addictions that run rampant in college, just towards the beaten and trod path to an unfulfilling life. So all these speeches were supposed to inspire the kids into life, but all I heard was watered down weakness. All I heard was slaves teaching other slaves how to be mediocre and keep the world safe. Never did I hear how to be dangerous. Now, slave morality, master morality, these can be kind of harsh terms, but honestly, I'm just referring to what Nietzsche saw as two parallel lines of moral evolution and moral feeling in humanity. One, the herd morality is more feminine and it's about the good of the herd. The other, the master morality is about how do we elevate individuals and how do we create vertical growth in culture. And here's the thing is both of these moral evolutionary lines exist within each one of us. We are the product of the master morality and the feminine morality. And it exists within each one of us and society. Now, the problem is not, oh, the slave morality is bad and the master morality is good. No, the problem is when there's a, 
unbalance in my mind, when there's an unbalance, especially towards slave morality, which we're seeing today, where our sons and our children are taught all about like being sensitive, about being empathetic, about being kind, about making everyone feel included. But they're told so little about, hey, son, this life, it's going to be fucking hard. But guess what? You can be great. And I believe in you. And it's going to take a lot of courage to, to find your way through this world. It's going to take a lot of discipline to build the, the kingdom that you want to see, right? It's going to take a lot of integrity to raise a beautiful family, to give your all, to spread love and value into the world and into your community and fucking thrive. You can thrive, my son. Let's go learn how to be a warrior together. Like that aspect is very unspoken to, to our children in our schools. Like all those speeches are about kindness, are about empathy and compassion and being a good person. But how much does courage and being dangerous and being excellent factor into being a good person in your mind, right? It's more of like a victim status versus a hero status that's being celebrated. And this is a problem because weakness, when, when weakness is celebrated, weakness corrupts. If you guys want to learn more about master and slave morality, I'm coming out with a whole podcast and video detailing Nietzsche's views on this. And also a lot of the evidence and philosophy for courage, for excellence is in my book, The Psychology of Slaying Dragons, which you can sign up for below to get the uh, notified of the launch date coming up here in later summer. So how does weakness corrupt? Let's go into it. Let's say a friend made fun of a guy in a circle of friends, right? And it was kind of playful, but it was also a jab. It was a little uncalled for. It's a bit malicious, right? We've all been there. A slave would take it and smile, but then hold on to, to the slight and build resentment, build hate, because they couldn't fight back. They didn't have the courage to speak up. They were being kind, right? And kindness was a virtue disguising their weakness. The weak person can't act freely, and they are dependent on others for status. In their cowardice, they quietly build resentment and work to undermine or subvert the powerful or wrongdoer, the free soul. They spread weakness and resentment like a plague through their gossip. They band together with other weak people and talk about how evil somebody is. Does this sound familiar, right? A powerful person would shoot right back. If someone made fun of you, like in a social situation, and it was malicious, right? The powerful person would shoot right back in that situation and tell them, you know, they would, they would trade punch for punch. Or... They would laugh off the jab as inconsequential because they're already secure. Oh, you're trying to jab at me? It's like, I really don't care. Like, I'm, I'm already fixed in my power. And at the least, at the least, a powerful person would take that individual aside later on and have a clearing confrontation, have a conversation, and just tell him what's on his mind, how he feels. That was not right. That was wrong. Don't do that again around me. That's how a powerful person would probably handle that situation, right? Where the weak person would build the resentment, would build the lies, would hide their intentions, would try to manipulate or bring down that person from the shadows. This is how weakness corrupts. Weakness creates a lie. It creates a superficiality. It creates the false lens of kindness. When there's actually evil cunning and malicious intent buried in the soul, but the soul is sick. The soul is sick because it doesn't, it can't freely and authentically and powerfully just express itself. It can't be direct because it is too weak. It has not been trained in the values, the noble values of courage, strength, overcoming, excellence, right? And because it hasn't gone through much and unveiled and cultivated a power at its core, it has to build power in subverted means, kind of like the person who wears empathy as a guise to gain power. They make a virtue out of their empathetic feelings to disguise their corruption at their core. Think about how many people you know who have that false empathy about them. 
who are like, oh, I care so much about this, or I care so much about this, or how are you feeling? Hmm. And it's just narcissism. It's basically their ego trying to celebrate, hey, I'm virtuous, check this out, I wear spirituality, I wear empathy, or I wear kindness like a badge on my shirt, I'm such a kind person. But that is their subverted will to power because they can't get power directly, right? They have to subvert it. They have to subvert everyone around them. They have to hide. They have to lie. This is really key because in Nietzsche's mind, the ancient master aristocrats of Greece, of the plains, of Europe, they they referred to themselves as the truthful ones, right? Because they had the power to be raw. Even if it was disadvantageous to them or even dangerous, they could tell the truth because they valued nobility. They valued power. The ancient Persians raised their sons to shoot straight and tell the truth. Why? Because only the weak and corrupt lie or need to hide. So the powerful person in history and even today is the essentially healthy individual. They have the power to respond to life, to be real, to be clear, to be direct. And in their freedom of action and expression, they find that deep, vital healthiness. And this is what Nietzsche saw. And this is what he was talking about in the master morality. Now, right here, a lot of people's prejudice that power is a bad thing is going to come out. And yes, We've often seen power depicted as greedy, as this corrupting force, as this like dominating and manipulative hand in all things. And honestly, to me, like that's not power. That's the manipulation of energy. That's unhealthiness. The the reality is, is we all need power. You need power to change anything, to grow, to overcome a limitation, to face a fear, to face resistance, to build something beautiful. You need power. In fact, without power... Everything is pure stagnation. Without any power, you are at the mercy of everything around you, of everyone else's opinions, of everyone else's judgments. You are at the power of all the currents of life and can't influence anything yourself. And that is a very, uh, that is a very weak and vulnerable place to be that no one really wants to be in. You see, we all have an instinct towards power and how real you are about that instinct uh is that's that's basically the only difference in people is how real are they in the relationship to power now nietzsche called this instinct in nature in ourselves the will to power and he saw it in all of the animal kingdom he saw it in our biology men compete for status to get the best resources to be able to provide for their tribe for their family and you know earn the best wife the same thing happens with gorillas you know fighting one another for dominance or you know, lions competing for the dominance of a pride or whatever it is, there's this will to power built in to nature in the material world. And this is what Nietzsche saw about the human psyche, right? Is there's this quest for overcoming, overcoming who we were, overcoming the challenges, the obstacles, the limitations that assail us, and always this quest for more power and more freedom. And he said that Our reason doesn't direct our instincts. This is the key psychological change you saw, you know, is our reason isn't being like, yo, do this or don't do that. Feel this way. Don't feel that. He's like, no, our, our reason rationalizes our instincts. Our reason doesn't guide our instincts. It rationalizes them. If we have the instinct to be powerful and important, which most men shy of aesthetic, ascetics and holy men are, they have this will to be successful, powerful, and, impor- and important. But if you're weak and impotent, you will morally justify weakness as superiority. This is an interesting thing. Nietzsche once wrote that I have often laughed at the weaklings who thought themselves good because they didn't have claws. If you can't gain power directly, you will seek to subvert those with power and also band together the other weaklings around you and masquerade as being powerful. Oh, I'm so virtuous because I'm kind. Oh, I'm so virtuous because I'm empathetic. Oh, I'm so virtuous because I'm woke. Oh, I'm, you know, it's all this virtue signaling to hide this deep resentment and impotency in the soul. And 
Here's the realization I've come to is that the feminine virtues of kindness, of empathy, are nothing without the masculine foundation of courage, of the quest for excellence in all things, of integrity and discipline. Without these foundations pushing you forward, elevating the roof of what you can be, empathy, kindness, these kinds of things that actually create for harmony within civilization and within communities are nothing because the individual is not growing. The power is not authentic. And all of a sudden, everything becomes warped. It becomes manipulative. It goes into the shadows of the of the unconscious because there's not this authentic and direct expression of power from within. The will to power has been... Uh, has been subverted, has been jaded. I wish I had the right words for this. And this brings us to the final part of the video and is it's what is virtue? To me, virtue is can only be such when there is the opportunity for the opposite. You can, kindness is not a virtue unless you have the capacity for malice, right? Discipline, for instance, is not a virtue if you're always being told what to do and have to do it. If you're obliged to do it, it's no longer a virtue. And to the slave morality, to the, the, to the herd, they're basically impelled by moral imperatives to be a certain way, to act a certain way. It's not genuine. It's not true. It's conformity. And for instance, Nietzsche spoke of the free spirit. And let's say this free spirit wanted to be generous. Generous Generosity would be a natural and, and an, an abundant overflowing, outflowing from his soul. He'd be magnanimous and generous and, you know, caring. And it would be real. It would be authentic. He wasn't being generous because everyone's like, yo, you got to be charitable. You got to be generous. You got to be kind. You got to be this way. You got to act this way. You got to be that Like if you're following moral imperatives that society is telling you to be, it is a symptom, it is a symptom of weakness. It is a symptom of conformity. And Nietzsche was really against shoulds and should nots, moral imperatives. He's like, no, gain power, cultivate individuality within you and let these virtues be natural outpourings of your soul. And all of a sudden through taking a path of power and and cultivating power within and cultivating your autonomy and individuality, you actually arrive at what real virtue is. You grow claws and learn how to use them, but also learn how to sheathe them, right? And that's the key difference, my, my friends, is I think in general, we have to come to terms with power and the masculine master morality that actually appreciates power, creates power, because that also creates authenticity. It creates realness. It creates truthfulness. It creates vertical growth. And I think it's a really important and overlooked aspect. And when when we are overly polarized towards the feminine virtues, towards the herd morality, everything is confusion. Everything becomes sick. Everything is horizontal expansion instead of vertical. And this needs to come into balance. Recognize the balance of the masculine and feminine and bring that inside of ourselves and get real with what values are going to create the best life possible for ourselves, for our community, and for humanity. I think that is a really important question that is being overlooked because we so care about safety and equality right now, and it is detrimental to the youth. Thank you for watching. This is Wisdom Warriors. I'm Christian. Subscribe for more videos like this. Let me know your thoughts on slave morality, on kindness, on, you know, how weakness corrupts and master morality in the, in the comment section below. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter for monthly essays on similar topics to this, and I'll see you at the next video. Peace.